record. Leave meeting. Run away. So, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're just waiting for Tito to get his fourth slice of pizza before we get, to... <laughs> before we get started. Uh, so yeah, this is uh, me. I'm I'm Prashant Punjabi. I'm going to talk a little bit about microservices. Uh, mostly, uh, I think the caveat to this is that I I did this mostly because I wanted to kind of just learn myself a little bit about microservices, the history behind microservices, and also the recommendations, the current state of the art and whatnot. So that's how this talk came about. And uh, let's go. Uh, let's see, this is work. No. Right. So anyway, so, so the, the title for this talk is microservices, what are they good for? Absolutely. I guess the song says nothing, but you know, I guess in this case, I guess it's something spoiler alert. I think we do discover, you know, microservices may be appropriate in certain certain scenarios, but maybe not as many as you know people might have hoped when they kind of started messing with them. Uh, so this is me. I have been working at Solution Street for about eleven years now, working in software development for about twenty years. I'm not young, but I'm not old either. I can see this is my recent birthday. It was a prime number. You guys, I'll let you guys figure it out what it was. Uh, earlier this year, earlier, earlier this week, you, yeah. <laughs> so, but you know, software development sometimes does make me feel like this. I get a little cranky when there's all these new things coming at me all the time. You know, I think uh, for a while it was JavaScript and JavaScript frameworks. Recently, it's been a lot of architecture-based information. Uh, you know, when we were in a room together, sometimes this is how I felt. Like somebody's trying to explain how everything works. And it's, you know, it's all over the place. And this is usually me, like just trying to figure things out. Uh, so when I started doing this talk, I started, you know, looking up, you know, what, what, how I could structure it, what I might base this on. And then I stumble across this very calm looking gentleman. Can anybody tell me who this, who this is? Maybe the older people can hold. <laughs> the younger people. Is that Martin Fowler? That is Martin Fowler, who's, I think, points for whoever said that i'm an old fart too prashant so <laughs> <laughs> that's great there you go so yeah so martin fowler i think i mean i think i I'd, I'd basically discovered a whole series of articles written by martin fowler and his associates and uh what you know they use uh it kind of that's what i used to start off with so what they describe you know basically what it came across as what is a microservice so microservice is basically an architecture style where you have an application and instead of having an application builder of modules that are interconnected and share you know the same process you basically compose the, the application using independent services and all the communication between the services is done over you know messaging or you know lightweight apis like rest or http lightweight protocols like that right so the idea is that the parts of the application are independently deployable you can switch them out you know as long as you don't break the contract between that part and the rest of the system and so on. I think that's the, the idea. And there is very little centralized management. Theoretically, you can use you know whatever you want for you know, writing those services because everything, all that matters is the contract between that service and the other services that are in the application. You could even write different languages and all that, right? So I think that's in a nutshell what a microservice is. Uh, you know, obviously the, the, the foil for microservices is, is what was classically known as the monolith. A monolith application, you know, you, you put all the app, all the functionality in a single process. And if the monolith, a monolith application grows, you grow by basically duplicating that, you know, as a, if you think about it as an application server, if, if it's growing, you know, application server does everything. And then you just, you know, put it in a cluster and you put a load balancer in front of it. So basically each part of the application does everything. And then you just sort of add, you know, more kind of more of the same thing to kind of to scale it, right? In microservices architecture, you basically have, you know, each element of the functionality is, is its an own service. So if you if you feel like some parts of the application are need more resources, you can just add resources to that part of the application, not everything. And then, you know, you can theoretically independently scale it, right? Uh, so 
we, we, we went through the definition of a microservice and there is no real, you know, formal definition of what it is, but, but as I think through the years and, and through, you know, I think this article that I wrote and that I, that I read uh, did describe the most common characteristics of a microservice, something that, that are the, some things that we'll find are common. Not all microservices have all of this, but you know, these things, some themes do tend to recur, right? So we'll just go through some of these initially. Uh, so we, we just mentioned, you know, we already mentioned this previously, uh, you know, when you have an application that is a monolith uh, or something, or, or, you know, most of the communication is just happening using in-memory you know, in function calls in a microservices, in, in the microservices environment, most of the communication happens, you know, through a web, web service request or, or a, a remote procedure call in VR. Services are independently deployable. Uh, you know, the idea is that you should be able to have when you create a, a component, a, a, sorry, a service that is going to be plugged into a larger application, the idea is that, you know, I think the, what goes into that service, uh, having it responsible for one particular thing is, is probably the biggest consideration so that, you know, when you switch it out, you know, it you, you whatever needs to be, I mean, if you think about a big system, you know, if you have user management, maybe, you know, just the authentication piece could be a service. And the rest of the application just depends on that, right? And then you can switch out the way you do authentication, but uh, but at the same time, as long as you don't, you know, as long as you take the username password and you let them know that the user is authorized or authenticated or not, you are probably okay, right? Uh, the other thing that that comes up quite a bit in terms of the mic in the microservice approach, you know, usually what we what what ends up happening is that you know the application or the service, the way it's structured, is organized around business capabilities, right? And uh, you uh, you split up the service you know as, as a company grows you add more things you split up you know each each department of business department has its own sets of services and they define contracts between uh, you know them and the other rest of the company and so on uh, and, and so one thing that came up when I was looking at this quite a bit was Conway's law right so what Conway's law says is uh, any organization that designs a system will produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. I see a people not. I see a few people nodding over here. So if you think about like you know the older organizations, you know usually we had a bunch of you know user interface engineers and they were middleware specialists. They used to be database engineers or database administrators. So the whole company was organized in that way. So any application yeah. that was built, application that the company produced, basically followed that, right? So they, they had a huge system. The user interface engineers did whatever they needed to do, and then the business logic, you know, the people who manage the the application server, they did their own thing. And if you needed something from the database, you know, you couldn't do anything. You had to, you know, in, the, in back in the days, we, even we had like you know stored procedures and things like that. You'd have to get the DBAs to write them for you. You need a database change. You need, had the 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 database engineer used to have to make it for you. You couldn't just do it yourself, right? Uh, so. So this is, I mean, so as as organizations evolve, as you know, as as ways to kind of structure applications evolve, uh, you know, organizations are are organized differently. So now Conway's law basically says that, you know, this it kind of uh, the current structure which kind of gave rise to the you know to, to to microservices also kind of reflects Conway's law a little bit. So now, for example, you think about a, a bigger organization. Uh, you know, I mean, one of the examples we'll see later is, is, is something about Shopify. Shopify has, you know, a shipping department. They have a business department, they have a tax department, and so on, right? So if you have, uh, uh, you know, if you have a, a group that is kind of just in charge of that, you know, they can manage all the services related to, to all of those, right? So, so that's, so then a team basically will end up having cross-functional capabilities, right? A team, will, uh, each team will have their own user interface engineers, they'll have their own Backend engineers, they'll have their own database experts, whatever you might need, right? So, so that's that's part of uh, Conway's law also. Uh, so the other thing that uh, that comes up in in in, in when, you, when you talk about microservices architecture is, is a different mindset, right? The mindset is the the you know, people approach basically what 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 you're building are products, not projects, right? The bad old days of server development, you know, there used to be a team that created the application and then handed it off to a different team that you know that deployed it. And then from then on, a, a different team maybe was in charge of maintaining it, right? In this case, 
uh, mostly what happens is that we, I mean, in microservice architecture, that's not very common. What happens is that a team is basically responsible for, you know, whatever it's doing, you know, from soup to nuts, right? They're responsible for building the service, uh, you know, as we'll see later, they're responsible for even getting it deployed. They're responsible for supporting it in production and all of that. Right? Mm. And then uh, the other thing is it's smart endpoints, dumb pipes, right? I think th this, this, again, this concept comes through uh, quite a bit also. Any Anytime you have, you know, many different services. I think we talked about like, you know, a, a one part, any service that, that we create, you know, the, uh, the point is for that service to be as cohesive as possible to kind of do everything that it needs to properly. At, at the same time, you know, you, you, you pick the boundaries between that service and then, and then, and the rest and the other services very carefully. Right. So the idea is that, you know, as you can see over here, I mean, this, this comes up during software development. This is not maybe a microservices concept. The idea is that whenever you build a system, you want to have loose coupling and tight cohesion, right? So a single component or single part of any system should be very cohesive. And then you know, there should be loose coupling, coupling between that and the, and the rest of the system. In, in monoliths, I think what we used to do, think about is basically like the user interface should be loosely coupled with the, the middleware, the middleware should be loosely coupled with the database. So you can swap these out and so on. In microservice architecture, you're basically thinking about this in terms of, you know, the the building blocks, which are basically services, right? So in this case, if you think about a large organization, again, you know, Shopify comes to mind, you have the, the user services and the shipping services and the, you know, the tax services, and, and they all, you know, do do what they're supposed to do, but the but the interfaces between them are, are pretty simple and, you know, you, you take care of those. Uh, decentralized governance, uh, this, I feel like is a is a is a double edged sword. I mean, uh, that's kind of mostly my opinion. But the idea is that you know the idea as the organization grows, you know, every team has the autonomy to kind of pick maybe the tools for what for the job, right? So, and and the teams are also responsible for building, you know, for for supporting the application twenty four seven, including getting it deployed, supporting it in production, and so on. Uh, this is is a great idea in theory, but I think practically. What happens is that based on the organization, it settles into you know every organization will will have you know a few technologies that they you know agree to support you know for in the long run. It's 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 in the business interest. In in much larger organizations, obviously there is more autonomy between in business units and so on. But you know, but this is something that that uh, is is part of you know what led to the evolution to microservices. Uh, the next thing is uh, decentralized data management. So as we are saying, you know. In, in the big system, the the database is, is common. It's shared across, you know, all the functions. In in microservices, that may not be the case, right? The idea is that each service maintain it, maintains its own data, and and you know uh, that way. And any any time any different a different service, for example, if a user needs to figure out, you know, if you if for a sale you need to pick out the the shipping cost or the taxes. You'll not be directly accessing a function. You'll be doing that over the network using a you know a remote call or something like that. So so when this happens, uh, so this is kind of an illustration of this model. You know you can see in a, in a monolith you have you know everything going to the single database. In a microservice architecture, you can have mul many different databases. Now these databases could be logical. It could be it could still be a single database. You know that is storing like different you know parts of the system under different schemas and whatnot. Or they could be physically different databases that right? you could use a relation database for one service. You could use NoSQL for a different service. It could be it could, it could be all of that. Uh, but what about transactions, right? So I mean, that's one thing. That's the first thing that comes through, right? So when you are uh, when you when when you think about you know distributed databases, uh, when, I mean, whenever data is involved, there's always you know you want to be consistent, right? I mean, you cannot you know send out some a package and not charge the customer for it, or, or you can charge, or, or the other way around, you can charge a customer, but the shipping label doesn't actually get sent out, right? So, so that's something that every like whenever a company decides to do something like this, I think they 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 come up with the with their way to manage it. Uh, and I mean, usually what will happen is that uh, you know there's a concept of eventually con eventual consistency, right? So the idea is that. Eventually, the data will be consistent. You are you are you are okay to handle a little bit of mismatch or inconsistencies in the interim, but for anything that is critical, you know you will only that will only kick in once you are sure that the data is you know is consistent eventually. 
The next thing, obviously, you know, infrastructure automation. This is again not. I mean, you know, this 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 article that I used was used uh, was was written a few years ago, and right now, I mean, it doesn't matter if if it's a monolith or a microservice. I mean, I think you you want to have a strong CI/CD pipeline, which is continuous integration, continuous delivery, automated testing. I think that is, you know, at this time it is kind of taken for granted. Like, you know, every good system will have all of that. But when it comes to microservices, I think this is extremely important. Uh, the idea is that, you know, you want to have automated test, automated testing and deployment, and deployments should be as boring as possible, right? So the idea is that, you know, if deployments are boring, then, you know, deploying one service versus 10 is, there's no difference between that, right? So that's, that's the key. Uh, and the last thing is, uh, the next thing is designing for failure. Excuse me. Uh, so microservice applications usually, I mean, what you'll have is a lot of monitoring of what's going on. Uh, you know, semantic monitoring is more like, you know, using a business use case to kind of monitor what's going on. If in case you miss something, an example of this would be you know, again, you know, if you realize that, hey, suddenly we haven't been sending any packages for the next couple of hours, last couple of hours, nothing's been sent out. We haven't had, had any sales, right? So even if you don't get any production alerts or something is bad, you're basically, your business use case, you know, because you know you're typically, you know, sending, you know, X number of packages per hour and suddenly you're not, you, you know something may be wrong, right? So you have to go look into it. And also as whenever you kind of, you know, uh, put a system together by having many different systems talk to each other, you know, systems will tend to fail in like, you know, new and interesting ways, right? So the idea is for you to kind of all to try and discover as much of that as much as possible and also be set up to kind of, you know, spot these kind of behaviors and, and react to those. Uh, evolutionary design. So what happens is that, you know, I mean, I think microservices when, it, you know, the way usually the, the way they come up is you know you you start with a big system and then you start you know, decomposing parts of it into into smaller pieces that can can you know talk to each other that way you can assign responsibility of a smaller system to to different teams and, and and things like that right so so the idea is is you know once once you have these systems then you you should be able, you should be able to uh, independently replace it and upgrade those systems right and as as we talked about previously i mean these themes recur quite a bit which is, uh, you know, you, you write a new user module or shipping module without affecting the rest of the application, right? And uh, and then, you know, if you have a newer version, so the rest of the application can, you know, then take advantage of the new stuff, but the old stuff still needs to work, right? So you have API versioning, you have many different ways of sort of gracefully degrading functionality, deprecating, uh, you know, use cases and so on. Mm -hmm. So, so those are a few, uh, you know, common characteristics of our microservices. So the next thing will be like some prerequisites. So these are kind of things that you must have in place before you even consider doing something like a microservices architecture, right? So the first thing is definitely rapid provisioning. You know, this, you know, again, this article was written a few, you know, a few years ago. So it says you should be able to fire up a new server within a matter of hours. And I kind of rewrote it to say, you know, you should be able to provision all the resources that you need for a new service maybe in a matter of minutes, right? I think it, we're in a slightly different world now. Uh, you know, you have basic monitoring to de detect serious problems quickly. You have to monitor business use cases, obviously. We talked about that a little bit already. Uh, rapid application deployment. And you know, I think these are all the things that we already talked about, right? I mean, being able to quickly, you know, deploy and upgrade to, without any downtime to be able to uh, design and upgrade so that, you know, it everything that is currently using the same service will continue to work. And then if you, if you added some functionality, if you're gonna take some functional, functionality out, you have to be able to coordinate that across you know, all your collaborators, right? Uh, and the, the next thing is, again, something that, we, that is already we, we talked about before is close collaboration between the developers and operations. I think the DevOps culture that is now ex exceedingly common across companies, I think it probably, got a big push because of this move into microservices because what we are like the services that we are managing the things that we're doing get smaller and smaller they get you know more virtualized they get deployed more often so the developers are now you know in, enabled and expected to sort of you know collaborate with with the operations team you know i think gone, gone are the days where 
you know, I think earlier I was talking about how how long I've been doing software development. I think there, there has been times where we've actually physically shipped a CD to, you know, install it in, in, a, in a server or something. But those days are obviously gone, right? So, and then again, you know, ability to react quickly when you when you indicate a problem. I think that's also very common. Actually, at at, at my clan, we had, there's a there's a talk later today about about ex, about what is expected out of development teams and who's in charge of what and i think that is constantly evolving uh, right now you know we have clients where you know we have people who are expected to be available you know for critical things even outside you know off hours right so there's no you know in my previous job we used to have like tier one support tier two support so the tier one support is like you know a call center gets called and you know but the development team is in already tier two right i mean it's uh, it doesn't matter if it's business hours and sometimes you Mostly during business hours, I haven't worked on anything life threatening. So I guess I've been fortunate in my career, at least that way. Uh, so, so we'll talk a little bit of, about trade offs. Like any architecture style, there are benefits and there are costs. So, so the benefits of microservice architecture is, you know, by definition, if you are, you know, if you're trying to do microservices, you, you have to have extremely strong module boundaries. You know, you, you will have, you know, uh, Types, like small small components which are which you know which should be cohesive if they're not you know you're going to kind of obviously pay for that uh, you know you should be able to you, you will be able to deploy you know small pieces and upgrade small parts of your application so that way you know you might get some velocity out of that you might be able to you know like you know you don't have to have one team that is held back by to upgrade their you know system because everybody else is you know on a different, different version of java or ruby or whatever right i mean you can just go ahead and do it right because you're you're using separate resources you're using separate you know uh, virtual resources and all that uh, technology diversity obviously you know we talked about that you know you can mix multiple languages as long as the contract you know if you are especially if you are communicating via web services it doesn't really matter which language each service is used because you're going to be kind of going over the wire uh, and then again this I guess I'm always a little little hesitant about this as, as a benefit. You know, I think I've worked in organizations where, you know, it would be, I mean, if you think about it, you have to be a really large company to be able to do this, right? If you're a small enough company, you know, and you have every little group doing their own, you know, uh, little language, I mean, it might not be the best thing, you know, for that company, but but in, in, in places where it makes sense, definitely, right? Uh, so when you talked about benefits, there's obviously there will be costs as well. Uh, you know, we have, you know, by definition, if the, if a microservice architecture, you have a distributed system and you have, when you have a distributed system, you know, you are, you are, it, it does add that overhead because every little thing has to go over the network. So you have to kind of, you know, there will be a lot of abstractions. You can't just hit the database to, you know, to, to grab some data that is, you know, from a different part of the application that right? you have to go over the wire. Uh, eventual consistency, we talked about that uh, already. Uh, you know, maintaining strong consistently is, is is difficult, right? Because it's you you have a large system, so every so every part of the system is 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 responsible for this, right? And some of these costs obviously are not just because of microservices. I mean, I mean these days we have, you know, most of the business applications will have like ETLs and integrations with other systems. So eventually, there always is like you know the system of record for any data, and then there are other systems that use that data. So so you have to be you know. That's something that that comes up, but it but comes up probably more often in this sort of architecture. And operational com complexity, you need a very like mature or, or operations team, right? Because you have now you have many different services. You know, you're you're deploying them often. You're monitoring them. You're monitoring communications going across them. So, so you know, uh, having a mature operation team is definitely uh, sorry. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, I can try. <laughs> sure. Uh, eventual consistency is, you know, if, for example, if you think about, again, I, I'm using Shopify as an example because I've been using that a lot, right? So the idea is, you know, you have an order. The order goes through, you know, the customer comes in, they log in, they buy a few things. So the shopping cart is its own system. Is it, is it, is, is, if you think about it, like if shopping cart is one service, shipping is a different service, billing is a different service. You know, and then the actual package going out and tracking of that is a different service. You know, as data as the customer moves through the flow, you know, you'll have you know many records created for you know to, to, to for the order 
the cost of the order that you know there'll be maybe a model that figures out okay if, if our taxes involved and so on right so all these systems will be writing data into their own you know database but but at the, when it comes to the part where you have to you have to charge the customer and uh, you know send the shipping order out you know you have to make sure that everything is in, in line right i mean if there's a you know if if there's a mistake in you know you're you're integrating with ups and the you know the shipping label doesn't come through or whatever that will that means that you know you cannot really charge the customer because you didn't generate you know the shipping label to ship it out right if you're charging them for shipping so i think that i think that's what i mean like in the, in the end eventual consistency means like each system will have its own data but but in, in the end, but there is there has to be somewhere where you have like the the full view of the data right so somewhere you have to maintain that okay this is the complete order from soup to nuts and you know we didn't we need to do something that is catastrophically wrong right so so different i mean this is a very simplistic example obviously and uh, uh, you know i think when we said uh, when we said that you know microservices are organized around business capability i think those are the trade offs that that people enter into right i mean in some cases you know you know for one of our clients we get you know information from about records you know like songs from different places right uh, every every system maintains its own database of you know recordings and so on and they are in charge of that data but you know other systems use it you want to make sure you're using you're using the right copy of the data but but in in, in some cases you say you know what if it's a day old it's fine we'll live with we we'll live with the you know with the with the trade offs that come with it because you know we need to kind of send this data to other places so they they can use it. so i think that's what i think that means but you know you have any well, follow up yeah You know, there can be scenarios or there can be systems that have multiple parallel processes happening. Yeah. And, but what you're trying to say here is eventually something needs to have a, a business rule that says these services must be complete before we can enact the next service. Right. Maybe. Yeah. But I think this is more to do with the data, right? I think I think I think the idea is that every service is, is maintaining. So the idea is that, you know, for example, the shipping. I mean, if you go from like, you know, you have to make sure that, uh, you know, if something fails, you know, you have a way to roll back something up and down the chain or you just have a way to retry it, right? Because, I mean, transactions are are hard to enforce, especially when network calls are involved, right? So you just have to code. I, mean, I think when, when that happens, we just code that in, right? I mean, like we have a, I mean, I, I'm actually in the middle of something that, that's not maybe microservices, but it does that, right? What we do is basically we, we have to go through and make a change in many different systems. And then we just have a flag for each, every time it's done, right? So the idea is that the method can, it just keeps getting retried till it you know, goes through all the steps. And the next time it retries, it just skips the parts that are done and it starts off from where it needs to kind of you know, pick up from, right? So, so it's, just, it's just the overhead that, you know, that this, each service has to deal with to make sure that, you know, especially if the service that is responsible for like, you know, doing a thing that is, Kind of irreversible, which is like charging a customer or something like that. You want to make sure that everything else was done properly before you actually do that. All right. Uh, so going on to common pitfalls, hype-driven development. This was in one of the articles that I read. Uh, I think that is extremely common, especially in software development. You know, whenever something new comes up, everybody wants to do that new thing. Microservices was that for a good number of years. I think everybody wants to say, hey, let's do microservices. Uh, cloud computing was the one before that. I mean, in some cases, in some cases, it's it's sort of harmless where people just use that as a marketing term, where they just sort of you know say whatever they're doing is this new thing, even if it's not, because they're just doing the same thing over again. But but in other cases, when people actually try to do things prematurely without having the prerequisites in place, you can kind of be in trouble, right? Uh, one of the things that can happen, for example, is that we talked about cohesion and coupling, right? So if you write services that are not cohesive. You know, you might end up in a, in a scenario where you have one, you know, every time you make a change to a service, you also have to change three other services, right? So that's a bad, that's a smell, right? I mean, the idea is that if you're doing that, means you obviously didn't architect your system properly. You did not right size your services. Uh, the other things are, 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 you know, things that are very common in, in all environments, but they're probably more acute maybe in microservice architectures, things like development environments. I mean, you know, that's one thing that I, you know, like, 
most of my experience, you know, I think I'm kind of biased in this a little bit. Most of my experience has been working on, you know, web applications. I like to have the whole thing on my laptop, right? Like, and like to see everything running from soup to nuts, even if I have to, you know, some external services have a way to kind of have them run, right? So it's more microservices you have, it's, you know, the harder it is to sort of run everything locally, right? There are obviously, there are a lot of tools available. You know, you can mock, for example, AWS services, endpoints, and so on. So that just goes back to like having a, you know, the prerequisites, having a, a mature organization that's set up for all that, right? So whenever you join, you know, a team that is working on microservices, you know, presumably they have everything else in place so you can be productive and you're working on the service that you're responsible for. And end-to-end -end testing is the other one, right? I mean, think of, you know, that's, uh, again, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a common problem right now, you know, even in monoliths, we have so many external services we have, you know, S3s, we have S3 buckets, we have, you know, indexes and so on. End-to-end -end testing is, is hard anyway, but it becomes, again, a little bit more acute when you're thinking about microservices because if a business, if, a, if an operation kind of spans many different business units, you need to figure out how you're going to do that. So, so the next thing we're going to do is just go through a few examples of, you know, our, organizations that did microservices or, or, or not based on, you know, their use cases. So the first example that I found, I found this really interesting was Khan Academy. So what happened was at Khan Academy, they had this huge monolith, which was written in Python 2. So when, in, when Python 2 was sunset, like end of life, they said, okay, what can we do now? Do we write the same thing again in Python 3? Uh, or do we do something different, right? So for through the evaluation, they decided to sort of switch everything up and can basically write everything using Go and rewrite in Go and also kind of switch from monolith to microservices. Uh, I feel like, you know, they were very uniquely set up to do this because they're using GraphQL as a federation service. So the, the article uh, that I read basically described how they did it and they basically did it a field at a time, right? So they had a, if you think about it, like you know, if a user has a first name and a last name, they had it broken down to the level where the first name comes from the Python monolith, the last name comes through the Go microservice, right? So, and then they had, you know, a, a tooling in place to do all that. Uh, and they, they went out, I mean, this was a very thoughtful way of doing it. What they first, basically what they did was they had, you know, they had a goal they work towards the goal. And the first thing they did was they, they defined something called a minimal, there was a minimal viable product. That's the most common term in, in software development. So what they defined instead was a minimal viable experience, right? So which basically kind of covers where most of the traffic is going. So and they said 95% of the traffic, uh, I think wherever the users are going, I think that kind of covers their minimal viable experience. So they put a lot of resources in upfront to make sure that 95% of the MVE was migrated. And then you know, after that, they slowed down a little bit and then they kind of, over the next couple of years, they, they kind of finished everything to, to, to include that. So this is, these are some, some stats which were interesting. So as you can see, they started with a million lines of Python code, but the, at the MVE uh, stage, they had, they still had 600,000, but then they had 700,000 odd Go lines of code. 24 months and a lot of resources. And then, you know, when they've had, in the end, you know, for the last 5%, it took another 18 months because I mean, obviously there were low priority things that needed to be migrated and the number of resources also reduced, you know, proportionally. Uh, and the other thing that I, I mean, the, the article is linked at the end of the, uh, the talk. It's actually makes, it's very worthwhile to read through it. One of the things that I found interesting was where when they were focused on doing the migration, in some cases, they just decided to port the bug. Right? Like they knew there's a bug in Python. Maybe they didn't know how to solve it. They need to be figured out, but they said, okay, that's not going to stop the migration. We're just going to you know, move the bug over to Go and then, you know, solve it later. Right? So that's an interesting approach <laughs> to do that. Uh, the next slide, and the next example is Amazon Prime Video. This is slightly counterintuitive. And this, you know, as the kids say, was viral on LinkedIn a few weeks ago or maybe months ago, I don't know. So, so what, so what Amazon Prime Video has, you know, I think this is one of the systems which was composed using, which was initially done using microservices. So they have this very elaborate system where they are basically evaluating the video, making sure that the video quality is good. So they are breaking down the video frame by frame and evaluating each frame to make sure that it's, you know, that's, that, that it's rendered correctly. There are no artifacts. It's not, you know, mungled or something like that, right? At least that's what I believe. That's what it does, right? So when they, when they did that, 
you know they you can see it's built up using you know they have a lambda up front they have step functions to orchestrate everything which is the step functions that are a way to kind of move things you know through a system step by step i guess and then the next thing they have you know they have functions to uh kind of you know based on the encoding of the video they have different ways to kind of you know process the video and so on right so so one of the things they found is that most of the costs associated with running this you know were was in the step functions and then the second biggest cost for them was the s3 bucket right because what they were doing is that because they were using microservices the data needed each frame had to be stored in an s3 service and s3 bucket so that the next you know uh, process that needed to actually evaluate the, the the issues with the with the you know with the with the video uh, they would uh, have to kind of get it from there right so what they did instead so when they rewrote the system you know they they, they evaluated and they decided you know very counterintuitively counter intuitively because you know amazon aws is probably the single biggest enabler of microservice architecture but for their own you know for their prime video product they decided, you know, it made sense for them to go back to you know, using a monolith, right? So they basically just created, you know, a system, you know, runs an EC2 and all the orchestration is done in memory. So, you know, everything just passes, you know, you don't have to go through, they, they, they eliminated the step functions, they eliminated the S3 bucket as an intermediate step. And they basically came, I think they ended up with like 90% uh, cost savings in the end. Uh, which makes sense for them. And then, you know, they did realize that, you know, they had to have a little bit of orchestration where through a Lambda function, but they're still based on the different types of detectors as they call them, you know, they, they still do that. But at the same time, you know, it's still running, the whole thing is still running in a EC2 cluster with different, you know, EC2 uh, machines doing, you know, a lot of the heavy lifting and it doesn't still, it still doesn't have that part where, you know, you have to, uh, have an S3 bucket and all that, right? So, so that's what they did. Uh, the next example is Shopify. I think I've used them quite a bit in, you know, in, <laughs> already. So, what Shopify had was, uh, you know, they started with the monolith, and uh, you know, because in, when you have a monolith, in the business application grows and grows. You know, at some point they decided it was not tenable. It was, it was, it was a big drag on the way. You know, nobody knew where to look for things. Uh, so, so they decided, okay, they needed, they needed to do a, a, de a rewrite, right? And a re-architecture. So they evaluated microservices, you know, they, they, they went through the microservices module. They said, okay, you know, if you do microservices, you know, we'll have to have different deployment pipelines. We'll have an infrastructure overhead for each, you know, for each call. And, and, and you know, we have so all the things that were, that are perceived sometimes as benefits. I think in, in their minds, they were cost, right? They were cost to the business. Uh, and also because they were trying to do a refactor of the existing code base, you know, to try to do that across, you know, many different uh, services that would be extremely tedious for them, right? Uh, so what they ended up with actually was something called a modular monolith. So as you can see over here, you know, this is a diagram that describes what that is. You know, if you have if you have a, a many different deployment units, and then you have on, on one axis on the x-axis is the number of deploy, deployment units and then the y-axis is the modularity. So microservices in the top right where they, you have many deployment units and also you have a good modular structure. Uh, but over here, it, there's a single deployment unit but you still have you know decent least structured modules. I think, I think that's where you end up with a modular monolith. I think this has come up, this concept came up quite a bit when I was you know researching the talk and even before that. I think that's uh, that's why I put it here as as an option, right? So so in, in many cases, I think this the idea is that if you have you know if if that makes sense for your organization, a modular monolith can be the best of both worlds, where you have clear boundaries between services, you have clear responsibilities. You can even you know partition your database so that you know each service maintains its own database, and you have communication across uh, you know different components. Or but at the same time. You know, you still have a simple deployment. You still have a uniformity across, you know, the languages and so on, which 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 might make sense for your organization. That's the idea. So, so this was interesting. So this over here, you can see. So Shopify was a Ruby on Rails app for for whoever. I think if if you did not know, so as you can see, previously they had everything, just you know, classic Ruby on Rails. They had assets, controllers, and so on. 
So after they did, the, they did the big rewrite, they basically, you can see they, they added the components folder and in, in, in under the components, they basically have, you know, business areas, right? So the business areas for them happen to be billing, checkout, taxes, and so on, right? And each of them, each of those components is basically a Ruby on Rails app, right? So that's where they ended up. And, and the way they did that was quite interesting. I mean, again, this article is linked at the, at the, at the end. So they just sort of put all their classes in a big spreadsheet and they picked where they thought it ended up. So, and then they just moved them under each of those, you know, business areas. And they did just one big giant, big bang refactor, like one PR to do the whole thing, which is pretty crazy and fun, I guess, too. But, uh, and then after that, you know, once they did that, you know, they tried to sort of keep, you know, improving the way, you know, defining the boundaries, isolating the dependencies, basically like just trying to improve uh, you know, the way each, uh, you know, business, each application was written. So the idea is that once you do that, then, you know, if you start on, on the billing team, you know exactly where to go, right? You know exactly where where you start. And then, you know, you can start with that and then, you know, and then sort of get, you know, more context later, right? So those are the some of the lessons learned from, from this effort was, you know, initially, so again, a, a lot of this sort of goes back to the objectives of the business, right? So whenever you have, for example, you know, a new app, if, if you have a startup or whatever, initially what makes sense mostly is just no architecture, right? You just want to get to market as soon as you can. You know, time to market is is probably the biggest driver early on. So, you know, so you don't worry about architecture. You just get something that works, you get it out there. And then, you know, and then once, once, once the application grows, you know, you, you kind of see which parts of the application uh, are getting more use. And you know you, you take it from there, right? So, so the, the next thing which I found was interesting was the best time to refactor is as late as possible. So the idea is that you, because you're constantly learning about your application, about the system, right? So, so the later you do the rearchitect, the more knowledge you'll have, and presumably you know you'll end up with a better system at the end. And uh, and in the end, you know, good software architecture is is just constantly evolving, right? So it's always it's, it's always evolving. It's always it just depends on. The scale that you're operating at, the kind of organization that you are like, part of. Um, so, so this is a uh, monolith. First, is 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 something that came up as you know, a, as a, as a as a philosophy, I guess that that many that that could be popular. It, you know, so the idea is that if you go directly to microservices, you know, there are dragons, there are, you know, there are there are. Uh, a pit, you know, there are, you might kind of, you know, not be, you, 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 you'll not be able to sort of decompose your application in a way that makes the most sense. You know, you might not, you might end up with like, you know, not very cohesive units. So, so, so if you, if you start with the monolith, you know, you try to kind of pay attention to the module boundaries. Uh, but then again, you know, moving things across modules is easier when you are, when you have a monolith. Right, presumably. So, so once you do that, once things settle down, and then you're growing a little bit, you know, then at that point, you know, you can think about, okay, now it makes sense to sort of, you know, in the next iteration of, you know, where you are doing a technology refresh, you might consider doing microservices, right? So, if you think about it, like the Khan Academy example is a great example of this, right? I think that's what they ended up doing essentially, right? They had a huge monolith which was Python two. And you know, at some point, you know, Python two was not going to be supported, and they had to do something different, and that's when they chose uh, to go with Go. And I think in the article, one of the lessons learned was, you know, was the decision to go to Go might have been a stretch, right? Because you're switching the language at the same time as you know, as, as moving over, you can't just copy move over code. I mean, Python two and Python three are very different languages, but you know, you could still like you know, copy paste and you know, make a change. Make sure you, you know things mostly did work. Uh, yeah, we did Python two to Python three <laughs> for our one of our clients too. It's fun. So, uh, so what was the so what's the best way to architect a system? So, I mean, you know, the the most common chief of thought, uh, uh, common I would say, uh, thought is to kind of start with the monolith, you know, figure out how things are going, and then you know later on you can try to decompose it. Uh, that's one thing that I feel like it's probably makes sense in most cases. Uh, one of the articles that I read also talked about, you know, you know, actually it's one of the examples that I didn't actually put in the talk, but it was about at a company where they started with them with 
they had a lot of microservices, but when it when it came to, you know, when this person was in charge of actually maintaining these microservices, for him, he thought for the organization that he was in charge of or the functionality that he, it, he was part of, it made more sense to sort of merge them back into a monolith. So, so that's that's what he did. And then I think, and then one of the lessons learned from there was, you know, it, it's fine to have a monolith and, and you know, use microservices for things that are you know that are actually need something that to be independently scalable and deployed and so on right uh, and the last approach is to just you know replace the monolith entirely again the khan academy is an example of that where you you basically start with a monolith you start with something quick something that gets you to market that helps you understand what you're building you know what may be popular among your customers and things and so on you learn about it and when it comes to actually like you know making it mature and a more long lasting, you know, mature business and application at that time, that's the time you can start decomposing it into microservices and slowly just phase out the model. So, uh, so for what it's worth, you know, microservices, one thing that I did discover was I think before my biggest pet peeve was I kept hearing the word microservices and I was like, so what exactly is a microservice, right? So through all this reading, I figured out that, okay, it's not, you know, microservices aren't really micro. Right, a microservice it doesn't necessarily mean it's just a lambda function that does one small thing, right? I mean, it's just a part of a bigger system, right? And and it all depends on the scale, right? I mean, for a, a small business application, you know, it could be just a lambda, but you know, if you're thinking about uh, something that operates at the scale of Amazon or Netflix, each microservice is basically a whole company, right? I mean, it's basically doing one big part of the uh, large business operation. Um, and the other thing is like, you know, most, I think it's, it's very, it's very attractive notion that, you know, you say that, okay, you know, you can have different parts of a system and each part can scale independently, but practically, you know, again, you know, that's not the most common use case, right? I mean, usually when you scale, everything scales together, there might be certain functions that need to scale independently. Uh, one of my favorite, you know, I was trying to think of an example. I didn't actually get time to put that in a talk was if, if, if you imagine like a, you know, a, a system that maintains like you know a list of concerts right so you know it'll basically grow you know they'll they'll, they'll get more bands and they'll you know, the schedules and so on most of these things will sort of grow you know as the site grows and it becomes more popular but then if you add the functionality to add photos for a concert right and process them that might be something that maybe needs to be scaled independently right because say you have a taylor swift concert suddenly you have a million people uploading pictures and that's going to probably affect the system, right? So maybe you want to like break that off and not have it not affect the rest of the system. So, so in the end, I mean, there's no right solution. Everything is mostly, it depends, right? It just depends on your use case. Uh, next up is micro front ends. I think that's something that came up the other day when I was talking to Robert, I think. Uh, that I think the first article about that maybe came up in 2019. So in five years, maybe I'll do a talk about that. That's, that's <laughs> so yeah. And these are all the links. So uh, most of these links are quite interesting. I just want to highlight a couple. Uh, the Netflix guide to microservices, I think, is is a YouTube talk that is that is definitely worthwhile. Uh, you know, that's one of those things where I looked at the talk. I was like that guy from Always Sunny, that I was like, I, I cannot get out of my head around it, but definitely recommend that one. And, uh, and yeah, thank you. And any thoughts? Thoughts? Orchestrate, like, what is, uh, maybe you might not know this, yeah. but like a typical orchestration system, how, does it use retry mechanisms? Is it queuing? How does, how does it sort of enforce it? Maybe there's some sort of size for you know, the, the process of design. Yeah. So for the, for the people on Zoom, I'm just going to repeat what yeah, Jeff yeah, said. Yeah. So Jeff is asking about orchestration, about what is the most common way to orchestrate and retry stuff. You know, is it queues? Is it flags in the database? I think I've seen. I think queuing is probably one of the more popular ways to orchestrate things. So you know that you know mostly you know queuing systems they guarantee delivery, in for a little bit of extra cost you can also guarantee del delivery in order, like the messages if you want to enforce ordering of messages and so on. In other cases, you know, I've seen for smaller systems, I think, you know, you have to have like a uh, process that just goes through and checks whether, you know, a, a process that has to go through many different steps is completed or not. So just having 
things in the database that that say, okay, this is done now, so flag this is completed, and so now it's going to be next step, right? So, yeah. Does anybody on Zoom have any thoughts about this? I, I don't really have any sophisticated thoughts about this. Yeah. All right. Any questions from the people on Zoom? I see something in the chat. Thanks, need to drop off data. All right. Thanks, Michelle. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Very good, Prashant. Thanks. Thank you.